Hi, I want to sell you cookies. Just kidding, I don't. I want to tell you about a debate. I don't know why I have this on. I originally got this because I wanted to use this to present my new country song that I just wrote and composed since I became an American citizen, which happened only recently, and now I couldn't find anything else, so I put this on. But none of this has anything to do with what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the fact that I just had the honor to talk to Bart Ehrman and conduct an interview with him that was 30 minutes long, which went into a lot of questions regarding Islam. Jesus, the resurrection and crucifixion, and the gospels, and so on. But even more interestingly, on April 9th, there will be a huge debate between Dr. Bart Ehrman and Dr. Mike Lacona, great Bible scholars. And they will have a seven-hour debate event on the topic, Did the Resurrection of Jesus Really Happen? If you visit apostateprofit.com slash Bart Ehrman, you can find this event and sign up for it for $39.95. And then you will have access to this live event and and also the recording afterward. And you will also have access to an online course. By signing up for this, you will also be helping this channel, Apostate Profit. And maybe next time I can think of something better than putting this on, which has nothing to do with the advertisement here. So sign up now on apostateprofit.com slash Bart Ehrman. Enjoy. Very nice to talk again, Dr. Bart Ehrman. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Nice to, nice to, nice to talk on my end too. The last time that we had a conversation, it was uh, very well. It was received very well. I think it was uh, fantastic, very interesting. We talked about a lot of things that uh, people do not often talk about that I don't see. And there are a lot of follow-up questions and a lot of things that I want to um, address today. But first off, uh, of course, you have an upcoming uh, debate uh, on the resurrection with Mike Lacona. I have a very diverse audience of Christians, atheists, ex-Muslims, some Hindus and Jews and Buddhists. This discussion is, is something Something that is relevant to a lot of people but if you could briefly explain uh, the debate and its relevance to the audience i would really appreciate that uh well yeah so i mean it's you know i just i it's a, really, it's a pretty important topic jesus resurrection is the foundation of christianity if, if jesus hadn't been raised from the dead there, you wouldn't have christianity and there are over two billion people in the world who worship jesus today so just historically this is a rather important thing did it really happen or not uh, and so, of course, Christians do believe it happened, and non-Christians don't think it did. And the issue is, is, that, is this the sort of thing that a historian can actually demonstrate one way or the other? Is it, is it susceptible to historical demonstration? Mike Lacona is a conservative evangelical uh, Christian apologist. He has a PhD in New Testament. He's written a couple of books, one of them published by Oxford University Press. And so he's not, he's not, just, he's not your uh, Bible-thumping televangelist, uh, you know, fundamentalist. He, he's trained and he is interested in the question of history. He thinks that you can historically demonstrate that Jesus was raised from the dead. I think that is completely wrong. I don't think it can be demonstrated. I personally don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I have reasons for not believing that. And so we'll be talking about things like, can you trust these gospels to give us any historically reliable information? Is something like this, like a, a, a great miracle, is this the sort of thing that historians can talk about? Um, if historians can talk about this sort of thing, why don't historians talk about it? You know, when you read histories of, uh, you know, the Second World War or the history of um, uh, histories of ancient Judaism or histories of Charlemagne or whatever, why don't historians say, yeah, and then this miracle happened? <laughs> you know, why don't they do that? Well, if they don't, if historians don't do that, why don't they? And why now can we do that if we want to talk about the resurrection? By the way, it's going to be a long debate. It's going to be like an all-day affair. It's not like one of these 30-minute numbers. This is, this is, we're going to be going at it <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> That sounds very exciting. If, if you could briefly, uh, could you summarize the general most popularly held accepted beliefs of what exactly happened uh, after Jesus died? Yeah, well, and the, the most common belief is the one that's presented in the New Testament, that Jesus was crucified on a Friday afternoon and he died around, um, he, di he, he died in the afternoon, mid-afternoon, and that one of his followers, Joseph of Arimathea, buried him, had to bury him quickly because it was getting dark. And when it gets dark, the Sabbath day, Saturday begins on Friday night in Jewish reckoning. And you're not allowed to do anything, work on the Sabbath. And so he had to get him buried quickly. So he put him in a tomb uh, quickly, wrapped him up, put him in a tomb, got dark. He puts a, puts a stone in front of the tomb. On the third day after that, on Sunday morning, 
some of Jesus' women followers went to make a more decent uh, proper burial for him, to do burial rites for him. And when they arrived, the um, they found that the tomb was empty and he he wasn't there. It wasn't actually empty. There was a man there or two men there or two angels there or whatever. There was somebody there who tell, told them that he, he, was, he was no longer dead. He had been raised from the dead and that the disciples were to soon see him. Mm -hmm. Then they did. So that's the question. Did that happen or not? Okay. Now, the Islamic perspective, that's where I bring my stuff in. <laughs> now, the Islamic perspective, as you know, is uh, very much that um, somebody was crucified on that day, but Jesus was not crucified. The Quran is very firm on this. Yeah. Jesus was definitely not crucified, but somebody was uh, made to appear like him, and Jesus was raised to heaven instead. I would like to ask you, from a historical perspective, from the perspective of a historian who deals with these matters, what is the evidence for and against this, and how credible is such a narrative? Um, I would say there's no um, actual evidence for it. The one piece of evidence for it is a piece of evidence that no historian would accept, <laughs> but I guess you would count it as evidence, apart from the Quran. So just bracketing the Quran itself. The Quran gets many of its stories. It doesn't tell that many stories about Jesus, but most of the stories about Jesus that it tells are uh, had earlier been found in the early Christian tradition. And this one, the story about them crucifying someone else, is uh, apparently was found in a gospel that was known in the second century that was written by a Christian Gnostic, a, a Gnostic, like a Christian heretic named Basilides. What Basilides said was that what happened was Jesus um, was going to be crucified and Simon of Cyrene was c carrying his cross for him. This, this figure, Simon of Cyrene, is found in the New Testament. In, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says that Simon carried his cross. Um, and so according to Basilides, what happened is when they got to the place of crucifixion, Jesus pulled a miracle and he made Simon look just like him. And he took on the appearance of Simon. And so the Romans thought they were crucifying Jesus, but they crucified Simon. And Jesus stood by the cross in looking like Simon, laughing. <laughs> Pres presumably Simon didn't think it was so funny. <laughs> Here he is. He's been crying. What? And so, uh, so that that's that's the only early Christian source for it. It's not. There's nobody who thinks that like is actually evidence for anything because we get these Gnostic Gospels with all sorts of interesting crucifixion themes. That just happens to be one of them. When I look at this whole concept of crucifixion denial, of people saying that Jesus wasn't crucified, that it wasn't really him, that it wasn't uh, Jesus himself, or that it was just an illusion and so on, I find that uh, such views are apparently found within different uh, Christian movements uh, that are seen as heretical. Which ones are you thinking of? I, I don't really know. I saw that uh, certain, you know, Gnostic or Docetic. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Early Gnostic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, my question is, why would these people uh, hold the belief that Jesus cannot have been crucified? Yeah, no, that's the important question. It really is the important question. And there are a couple of ways Gnostics worked it out. The problem that Gnostics had is Gnostics, Gnostics were, so we call them Gnostics because it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. These are people who thought that salvation did not come by believing in Jesus' death and resurrection, or, or it didn't come from faith. Salvation came by knowledge, and the knowledge involved recognizing that some of us have a divine spark trapped within us, that it's imprisoned in our material body, and it needs to be released uh, from the body so it can have salvation. And the way it's released is by acquiring proper knowledge, gnosis, so that it can escape the confines of its body. Uh, in this in this view, uh, you can't figure out the world by, you know, you can't get the knowledge by figuring it out. Somebody has to come from the heavenly realm to give you the knowledge so you can go, go yourself to the heavenly realm. And in the Christian Gnostic systems, that's Christ. He comes down from heaven and he, he, and then he gives the knowledge. People learn the knowledge. They get their salvation to escape their bodies. This was dead set against the other Christians, the majority of Christians, who said that Jesus was a human being who was also divine in some sense, and his death is what brings about salvation. For Gnostics, the idea is to kill the body so you can get out of there. It's not to have salvation in your body, and the body is not going to bring you salvation because the body is this evil material thing. And so Jesus could not have died in the body because Christ is not 
from the material world. And so they had to work out ways that how it worked then, because, you know, you got these stories of the crucifixion. So the, the minority ways, the one I mentioned by Basilides, a Gnostic, that, that is a you know, change of appearance. The two more common ways, one, one other way is just to say that Jesus didn't really have a body. He just seemed like he had a body. He was like, it was a phantom. You know, they thought you could touch him and stuff, but he didn't, it wasn't really a body. So when they killed him, they thought they were killing, they really killed him. You can't kill him. <laughs> He's Christ. And so, the, but the more common way actually was to say that, that Jesus, there was a man, Jesus with a body. I mean, a real man. He was just, he was a man. <laughs> he was very righteous. And because of that, the divine realm had sent a divine being into him that, that kind of possessed him at his baptism. The spirit comes into him at his, at his baptism. And he, he, then he can do his miracles and do his preachings. And at the end, the spirit leaves him. Uh, the, the divine element leaves him. So on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me behind? because the divine element can't suffer. All of these are trying to show that the divine element can't suffer, which means that Jesus' body, that Christ's body cannot be crucified. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm asking this question, uh, maybe it's obvious, but um, I'm asking this question precisely because Islam adopts this whole view that Jesus was definitely not crucified, that this is unacceptable to hold. But Islam also rejects the notions that Jesus was uh, divine or out of this world and uh, clearly says that he was merely a human. As far as I see it, uh, the idea that Jesus cannot have been crucified actually fits into those uh, ideas, the Christology of such movements, but it doesn't really uh, make sense within Islam, right? Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I've always been confused about why why both things are operative at the same time in, in the Quran, and I don't, I don't have a good explanation for it because it seems to me that it, I mean, within the, the Islamic system, it'd make perfect sense for Jesus to be crucified, and I think part of it is that you, that I think part of it is that the Quran is probably a complicated document, more complicated than most Muslims would say, and that there are various traditions that have gone together into the making of the Quran. And this is just it's kind of speculation on my part, but there are parts of Christianity that wanted that want to deny the physicality of Jesus. There are other parts that want to affirm that Jesus was raised up into heaven. And there are other parts that affirm that, you know, he's completely God. And I mean, you've got these various parts of Christianity and in the Quran, you're getting various elements of this put together, but you're putting together a couple of things that don't really, you know, from different parts of Christian beliefs that don't seem to add together. So I, I think I agree with that. Although I don't have a good explanation for it. Yeah, the, the same thing about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is, of course, something that is uh, very prominent. Um, you have spoken about it, how that might be or is a fictional account that was added later on, as far as I remember. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but as far as I see it, virgin birth is something that is also associated uh, among cultures with... Uh, a divine nature or divine fatherhood, which is why this individual doesn't have a regular human father. That basically means he comes from a divine source. But Islam also has a virgin birth, despite rejecting the whole story of divine origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, so it's true that throughout the Greek and Roman worlds, there were stories of people who were divine, who were born of a union of, of a God and a, and a human. Um, and so they're sort of half human, half divine, uh, most famously uh, Hercules or, or Heracles. Uh, but there, there are a number of others. Uh, in those accounts, um, one thing that's different with Christianity is that in these Greek and Roman accounts, the woman's never a virgin. Um, she's a woman. She, usually it's a married woman who's had a lot of sex. Uh, and usually the God actually has sex with her. <laughs> and sometimes you get some pretty raucous stories that are pretty funny, actually, about how it happens, how the God pulls it off, because he's got to, like, convince her. And so, uh, and so like, there's identity switches and stuff, kind of like facilities and Simon. So, um, but uh, but she, she definitely has sex, and the God has sex with her. And so the issue in the New Testament is Mary is said to be a virgin, um, not to have had sex. And so it's like these stories. Because God is the one who gets her pregnant, but it's very hesitant to go into kind of any physical details, and it looks like it's not involving sex. So, um, yeah. So, but that's absolutely right. Now, why the Quran would pick up on that, I don't know. I mean, you know, I suspect that a lot of this is, I mean, of course, that um, that Jesus is a great prophet, 
And so we have something special about him. And these are the things in the New Testament that are particularly special about him and in early Christianity. And so they're taking over some of these things, uh, even though it's not quite sure why they, why they need them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One other aspect is uh, the, the idea that Jesus uh, brought people back, back to life, that Jesus resurrected mm -hmm. people, and then also something that is, for example, mentioned in the uh, in the infancy gospel of, uh, of of Thomas, I believe, which is that he uh, uh, breathes a life into uh, clay birds for fun uh, <laughs> or yeah. to get out of the situation. Yeah. And uh, these two things are also mentioned in the Quran, that he brings somebody back to life and that he gives life to clay birds. Yeah. The Quran of course, adds with the permission of Allah. But uh, to ask the question, why in a Christian narrative is Jesus a character who can give life and to resurrect people? Well, so that, you know, that's that's in the New Testament, of course, and it happens uh, on a number of occasions in the New Testament um, that Jesus raises somebody from the dead. And it's um, it's des it's designed to show his that he had... I think in the early gospels, it's designed to show that he has God's authority, that he is able to, that God has authorized him to, to fulfill God's will on earth. And so he's got God's authority. When you get to something like the gospel of John, which is our last gospel, it's more than, than, than Jesus having God's authority, is that Jesus himself is divine in essence. And so in the gospel of John, Unlike, unlike the other three, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is said to have existed before he was born, before he came into this world. He's pre-existent. He created the universe. He, then he became a human. And so he's a divine being who's become a human. Um, and that's why he can raise people from the dead. And in the Gospel of John, he does it in order to show that he is the way to have eternal life. He brings life. And he proves it, raises people from the dead, raises somebody from the dead. I just want to remind you again of apostateprofit.com slash Bart Ehrman, which you will find in the description. There you can sign up for the debate between Dr. Bart Ehrman and Dr. Mike Lacona. Let's do this. Uh, the question on the claim that Jesus and his uh, immediate followers and believers were Muslims in Islamic terms, which basically means that they were um, in submission to the one God and they didn't believe in anything that Islam deems heretical, for example. That would include, however, the idea that Jesus Jesus is, as the Quran says, just a messenger who only came to deliver a message and to inform the people about somebody who would come in the future after him. As far as I understand it, however, Jesus and his uh, the people around him had the idea that Jesus was something like the last one. Right. So within that context, how much would Jesus, uh, from a historical perspective, uh, as far as you have researched him, fit into this Islamic perspective? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's kind of an interesting question. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. You know, I, I think I think um, if early Christians were alive today or if Jesus was alive today, he'd be surprised to hear that he's being called a Muslim. <laughs> I don't think uh, it's not really uh, so. But um you know, or to think that he was, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the difficult one of the difficulties is that when you're asking a, when when one asks a question like this, a very very important question, one has to ask really what is one asking? Is one asking about how he's being portrayed in different gospels, or is one asking about how what the man himself actually thought? And it's a it's a very, very important distinction that most people don't make. I mean, it sounds like you're making it because you say what's historically what's the case. I don't think that Jesus thought of himself um, in Muslim terms, uh, but I don't think he thought about himself in Christian terms either. I think when you do a historical analysis to figure out what Jesus thought, I think he did think that he was a prophet. Um, I think ultimately, though, that he thought that he was the one he was not only the one who was proclaiming God's truth to those who could hear. He, he was that, so he was a prophet in that sense. But I think Jesus also believed his apocalyptic message that God was soon to bring destruction and to set up a new kingdom on earth that would be a utopian kingdom for those who, who did what God, what God demanded of them. And Jesus thought he himself would be the king of this kingdom. So uh, Jesus, I think Jesus believed there was going to, that Israel was going to be made a sovereign state. Jerusalem would be the capital. 
he would be the king and his disciples would be his co-rulers. Um, and so he did think he was a prophet, but I think he thought that he was the future Messiah in that sense. Not the Messiah who was going to die to save people for their, their sins. No, nobody in Jesus' day had that idea of a Messiah. Um, Christians invented that idea of a Messiah. But in Jesus' day, people would expect there, there might be a future king who uh, sets up, uh, you know, and so uh, that's what happened. He sets up, uh, he, he was expected to set up a kingdom. And I think he's the one who, who conceived of that idea. So it's really not the Muslim view, but it's also, you know, it's not the Christian view either. Mm -hmm. So a, a very quick follow-up question for clarification. Uh, the entire idea that Jesus is uh, in any way the last one who is about to uh, bring the, you know, the, the the end uh, let's say yeah. or, or will be the seal yeah. is this would you say this is uh jesus's own idea historically seen or is this something that was entirely invented after him no i i think you, i mean there weren't going to be need any need for prophets after jesus because the kingdom of god was going to come so i'm not sure if he talked about him as the final prophet this idea of the final prophet in judaism is that elijah will come at the end hmm. And Jesus was thought of by some people as Elijah come. The question is whether Jesus himself thought of himself principally as Elijah or more as the future Messiah. There are not traditions about Elijah becoming the Messiah. And so I think his principal understanding was that he was going to be the king of the kingdom and that he currently was making proclamation. And so I think if you had him here to ask, he wouldn't say, uh, he might have said, well, yeah, I am the last prophet. It wouldn't be like the capital L, last, capital P, prophet, like this figure that he was expecting. It's just by the nature of things, you're not going to have prophets anymore, and he's the last one. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, very quick question, just because it came up. Nothing to do with the topic, completely off topic. But you mentioned Elijah. Uh, can you briefly tell me uh, what the meaning of Elijah in Hebrew is? I should know that, right? <laughs> uh, well, El and Eli means my God. Uh -huh. Yah means Yahweh. So my God is Yahweh, I guess. Yeah. So, so the name... <laughs> <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> wow. it, it's something that you would not really think about because it's just it's just a name. But uh, I think it's very important within the Islamic context when I analyze uh -huh. Islam because Islam doesn't ever have the name Yahweh for God, whereas yeah. this is very dominant prominent in uh, the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And Elijah's name is very blatantly, my God is Yahweh. So this yeah, is something yeah, that yeah, I find very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Glad I remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't ask too uh, difficult of a question. I guess. <laughs> You're close. <laughs> <laughs> um, some little questions uh, to make it interesting. What language did Jesus uh, speak and what language were the early Gospels uh, in? I don't think this is uh, really a hard question. I think this is an easy one. I think this is, I think this is a slam dunk. Jesus spoke Aramaic. His followers spoke Aramaic. Um, and the Gospels are written in Greek by people who probably did not know Aramaic. I don't think Jesus knew Greek. His disciples, I think there's no way they knew Greek. And um, so the Gospels are written in a different language from Jesus. When it comes to uh, what Jesus called God, what is the most common form in which Jesus would refer to God? Um, he probably referred to him as um, probably El and Adonai, okay. Lord, God and Lord, I would say. They, they were not pronouncing the Tetragrammaton, mm -hmm. the, the, four, you know, the, the sacred name Yahweh. They weren't saying that, so he wouldn't have said that. But he might have said, you know, he might have said El Shaddai. He might have said, you know, there are names in the Old Testament, God Almighty, El Shaddai. So there are names in the Old Testament he probably would have used. What about the the uh, the word Father or uh, yeah. Abba? I believe that's it, right? Is so, is that something that is historically verifiable that that was used by him? Well, it's it's likely that he used it. The it Abba. So father is a different word. Abba is more like, I mean, Abba means father, but it's more like a term of endearment, more like daddy or something yeah. like that. And so he, I think he did, did use the term father as well. For example, in the Lord's prayer, if he taught this prayer, which I imagine he did, some, our father who's in heaven, but, but at times in prayer or sometimes he would, he would address God as Abba. 
And since that's not a common usage at the time in Judaism, it looks like it's something that he did. And it, it's used to express his kind of close relationship with God as the son of God. So, you know, I think he did think that he had a particularly close relationship with God. And so it's not, wouldn't be weird for him to have used this term. Yeah, it's, it's a very special way to refer to an entity, I guess, uh, in terms of closeness. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's not the kind of transcendent, you know, it's more like, you know, dad you know father papa another question is about the gospel now um uh, going to the quran again the quran in chapter 5 verse 46 uh says um something along the lines of and we sent jesus and he verified the torah before him and we gave him the gospel the injil which as far as i understand it uh comes from the uh the, the greek word for the gospel and we gave him uh the injil the gospel in which there was guidance and so on now i remember during our last conversation i uh asked you whether Jesus brought a scripture and we talked about whether Jesus uh, could have uh, you know uh, constructed a scripture or or, or not uh, there are a lot of discussions in Islam about what this really means the general idea is that a certain scripture was revealed through Jesus and this this was either uh, noted by people around him the direct revelations coming through his mouth or that he literally gave people a scripture in your esteem did jesus produce a scripture that was a revelation or that was meant to be a revelation and a scripture from god uh no uh i don't think jesus could write <laughs> i don't think he was literate i mean he might have been reading literate but i don't i don't think he would have learned uh to write you know in early christian the earliest christian text this word the, the greek word is euangelion uh the translated as gospel and in early um in early uh christianity it did not refer to a book it was a term used in greek to just mean like good news about something so like if your army won the war the soldier the soldier would come back and say we won and that was the euangelion it was the good news and so in a Christian context, I, you know, in, in the Quran, centuries later, it had, probably has a different meaning. But in an early Christian comment, it would be uh, it would mean that Jesus delivered the message that he, uh, you know, of God's new message, the message of salvation. The irony in Christianity, I think, is that Jesus certainly did proclaim good news. But the good news that he proclaimed is not what the Christian message ended up being. Jesus was telling people that they needed to repent because the end of time was here and God was soon going to destroy those who were opposed to him. Uh, and if they wanted to enter to God's kingdom, they had to turn their lives around. And that was his good news. But uh, and the way they turned their lives around is by obeying God and following the commandments that God has given, um, keeping the Torah. Uh, but then after his death, his disciples came to think that, in fact, Jesus' death and resurrection is the good news and so believing in jesus death and resurrection is what brings salvation and so the irony is that christianity is based on the gospel of euangelion that's different from the one jesus preached <laughs> so yeah now we have two things that you mentioned uh what the gospel or the good news could uh, would be in reference to now there is the the whole christian idea uh the, the death and resurrection and salvation and then there is uh the coming kingdom of god and people must repent and so on in both cases uh it implies that jesus is uh kind of the the end the seal or that you must uh you know, cling to him to be saved if we assumed that the Islamic perspective is indeed true and Jesus was just a regular human being who did not prophesy an imminent end, what would, in your opinion, a good news, the gospel, be in reference to? Would it make sense? I think you'd have to imagine that Jesus was preaching the coming of Islam, right? That he was, that he was proclaiming that there's going to be something else, um, which... I think he de decidedly did not proclaim historically, certainly not in the New Testament, certainly not in the New Testament Gospels. But I think, no, I, I don't think that's what Jesus was about. Uh, although I can understand a later religious tradition wanting to argue that is what he was proclaiming. That's fantastic. I think you very much answered uh, all my questions. I'm always sorry for coming with all these outlandish questions uh, to you. <laughs> <laughs> like being my doctoral exam again. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, there was something that was on my mind, but it escaped me. But I don't want to take more, more of your time. I think I think we're very much done. A very quick final question: From a historical perspective, would it ever be reasonable to dismiss all the evidence for a historical figure for 600 years and then only take a scripture that comes 600 years later as the most credible source, such as in the case of Jesus, where he lived and died, and then 600 years later the Quran came and told us what really happened? No, I don't think it's cred not historically credible. But if if you're a Muslim, then you would say that it, you know it's an act of God, and then, so history isn't really what matters anymore. Um, and so if it if history doesn't matter, you can make theological claims. If history matters, then obviously sources written 40 or 50 years after uh, are more likely to be based on reliable tradition than sources written 600 years later, especially when you can show that the, the a source written 600 years later is dependent on these earlier sources. <laughs> and so I don't think that it's, I don't think it's historically credible, but people who have faith in, uh, in the God of Islam would, would say, well, that's how it happened. And so there's no arguing with that historically. There, there might be ways to argue about it uh, theologically, but not historically. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bart. I mean, I appreciate you a lot. I will. I hope to have uh, conversations with you again in the future. Uh, uh, are you comfortable with my handling? Was that better than Paul or? <laughs> better than Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're both you're both apostates from your religion, so I don't know. <laughs> religion you like, I guess. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add? Or... No, I, no, this has been great. I really appreciate it. It's been, you know, because it's it's nice to get some different questions, <laughs> and, uh, and so. Uh, but these are these are they're obviously very important questions for um, for uh, Muslims as well as for Christians to hear these things. Because most Christians don't know anything about the Quran, let alone the Quran's understanding of Jesus. And so that's it's very good. Wonderful, fantastic. Thank you so much, Doctor. Okay, Bartman. my pleasure. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good day. There you go. The standard narrative has holes in it. Bart Ehrman has been extremely helpful. And I want to thank him by telling you that you can still sign up for apostateprofit.com slash Bart Ehrman. Have a fantastic day and stay away from Islam.